important issue this is, the Merrimack. As a public health scientist, my colleagues and I think about problems from the perspective of human health, from the perspective of pr protecting health. And I heard our representatives mention health. That's critical. That's the only way to get to people, fundamentally, is about our health and our children's health. So today I will use that lens to examine what we know about the Merrimack generally, and more specifically about some of the stressors those things that impact the river. So my objective in the next 10 or so minutes is to step back a little bit to identify what challenges we face and perhaps look at this from a holistic perspective. But looking forward is really the goal of identifying solutions. So I'm not a pie in the sky academic I think about practical solutions. I pay attention to the data, and we can only make good decisions when we have good data available to us. We also pay attention to efficiency, cost, and sustainability. But because we are dealing fundamentally with a human issue, we will necessarily need to recognize the challenges ahead in addition to engineering solutions and raising money and legislation, we will need community engagement and community empowerment. And that is key to what we do. So what's in the Merrimack River that's harmful to health? How might people be impacted specifically by those agents? And what data are needed to prioritize the problems? So why do we care about the Merrimack is because it's a drinking water source for over uh, half a million people. That Those numbers will increase as other communities come on board. It's a recreational source for people who kayak, who boat, who swim, who catch and consume fish from the water. It's a food supply resource as well. These are all human activities, and they're the people who do them want to know that their health is protected as they engage in those activities. But the problem that you all know is that the Merrimack is an avenue for waste removal, right? It's like a big toilet bowl. We'll get to some of the particulars, but there's about 176 million gallons per day of effluent heading into the Merrimack. It's a big, beautiful river from the north, pristine wilderness as it goes, as it flows further south, it encounters larger and larger population densities and more and more inputs. You already know about the CSO problem, but there are other issues as well. But the problem of contamination in the Merrimack is historical. This is not a new 1950s, 1960s kind of thing when we instituted large treatment plants and discharge systems. Waste discharges to the Merrimack began when the Europeans came and started populating the banks. The left side, my husband said, put a sign on what that is. That's a privy, okay? And it is actually over the Stony Brook it's a tributary to the Merrimack, and how convenient that is, right? Talk about direct discharge. <laughs> so where are we today? We have more distance between the privy and the water, but essentially we're still faced with flush it away, and flushing it away brings it to the Merrimack. On the right side is an illustration of early historical industrial pollution and waste discharge to the Merrimack. These large, wonderful industrial communities began discharging untreated waste, industrial waste, into the Merrimack years and years ago. So again, we're not dealing with something new. We're just dealing with more of it. It's more complex. The wastes are more complex. So we need tools to understand what's in that waste. 
So there's always been a connection between river water and disease, at least back to the 18, mid 18, late 1880s or 1800s. And in fact, there is a connection between what we see uh, historically on this beautiful river. Back in the late 1800s, there was a typhoid epidemic in Lowell. It was an engineer, also a public health scientist at the time, who developed a method for measuring the germs in the water, in the drinking water of people in Lowell. He also was curious, why are the rates of disease, of, <clears throat> excuse me, of typhoid in that epidemic so high in Lowell? So he applied the same kinds of tools we have today, geospatial modeling, testing, talking to people. And lo and behold, he and his assistant found fecal bacteria in abundance in the water supplies and traced the source of infection to an outbreak of typhoid in a neighboring village to the north. It's not good to be downstream. So, the Public Health Service, the U.S. Public Health Service, shortly thereafter, recognized the efficacy of treating sewage with chlorine to kill the germs. Where are we today? In a very similar place, a little bit more complex. But we've been dealing with a historical problem, again, that's just larger and more complex. So what are the sources of sewage and other effluent into the Merrimack. We've already heard about the CSOs, your experts on this, not I. Wastewater treatment plants discharge their effluent. What's in that effluent? There are people who know exactly what's in that effluent. Many of us have a, an idea. Um, we also have industrial discharge, permanent, legal. What's in that industrial discharge? Again, some of it is known, some of it is not known. Perfectly legal. We also have stormwater and urban runoff. So what's in the river? We know there are bacteria. Are there viruses? We know there are chemicals. We think there are nanoparticles and microplastics. Per and polyfluoroalkyl substances that you'll hear a little bit, a little bit more later on. Uh, that is the shiny new object that we're paying attention to. But this other stuff has been there all along and remains there. We also know there are excess nutrients. So a variety of stuff in the river, and we need to know how much, how it impacts who's using the river, and only then can we determine what we can do about it. So again, the major uses by humans need to be the target of how we look at and understand what's in that river. So here's the question, what do we know? How do we know what's in the Merrimack? Well, we don't know exactly, but we want to know. So we think we need to do a bunch of testing. We do some testing, and there are a lot of people out there generating data, testing the water, but they're in pockets, they're in files, they're unaccessible, we haven't had communi good communication. But we do know that people are testing for a handful of microbials. We use indicators for the presence of pathogenic compound, pathogenic microbials, and my colleague Greg Coyle will talk about this in a bit. We test for a handful of toxic chemicals, a very small handful of those chemicals that we know are in certainly in wastewater, and we do not know how much is discharged. We do not require ongoing monitoring of effluents. We do not require that those data are publicly available. The permitted effluents are cursory at best and never require testing for, well, we don't have data for unregulated contaminants. They may be out there, but we do not have access to those data. So that's a concern to the scientific community and to the community using the, 
the, uh, the river. So current testing protocols really do not adequately inform good public health decision making. There's a gap between what's in the river and what we're testing for. And we need to prioritize. So let's delve a little bit into, so what do we think is in the water? You've heard about microbial contaminants. We're concerned about those because they can cause disease. That's acute disease, right? So it's, you're going to get sick, you're going to get diarrhea, or vomiting, or perhaps worse. Um, and so we measure bacteria, but they're not the pathogenic bacteria. Maybe there are viruses. There are some data. We don't have enough. But really, the other class of contaminants that we need to be paying attention to are those that we look at to which we might be exposed on a longer term basis, to lower levels. And those include the things that you are going to hear about next, about microplastics. We know nothing about the nanoparticles. Um, we know about the metals and the toxic chemicals, in which I would put the metals as well. These are chemicals that, at very low doses, can adversely affect brain development of children, can adversely affect the immune system, the reproductive systems, can cause cancers, and they're out there in the environment. We don't know how much is there in the Merrimack because they're poorly monitored and largely unregulated. And importantly, they're increasing in number and amount. Why is that? Because society requires more and more things, we generate more chemicals, we generate more products, and we currently do not have a system that requires us to have pre-market testing. So that complicates the fact that we have more chemicals, but we also have more people using them, so we have an increase in the numbers of those chemicals that are in our bodies that gets discharged into the waste and may or may not be removed by the wastewater treatment plant. So I was talk, asked to talk a little bit about pharmaceuticals, and I actually would put those in the toxic chemical category. While pharmaceuticals have a function in terms of increasing health or improving health when used incorrectly or at the wrong time during development, they have a toxic effect. And so pharmaceutical use is increasing over time. We know that about 50% of the US population used one or more prescription drugs in the past 30 days. Over-the-counter meds are unaccounted for. Um, and if I won't ask you, because I would need an institutional review board re uh, agreement to ask you how many of you take pharmaceutical medications, I would find that there's a very high number. And I would ask you where they go. So once they go in your body, they do what they're supposed to do, and, they, and most of them are excreted, either in their original form or metabolite form. What goes in the body comes out. Where does it go? In a CSO event, it goes out directly into the water. So it's in that gamish of sewage that is untreated. Under the best of circumstances, it goes to the wastewater treatment plant, where it may or may not be removed. Some of the most commonly detected pharmaceuticals in wastewater are high blood pressure medications, antidepressants, cholesterol-lowering drugs, antibiotics, epileptic drugs, Tylenol, caffeine, sucralose, and opioids. I don't know about you, but I don't want to drink that. Maybe I want one of them. Maybe it's cheaper that way to get our medications from our water. But um, what do we know about their presence in the Merrimack? Well, the study was done, first of all, by USGS. They've done a number of studies on pharmaceuticals in water, in wastewater, and in drinking water. And they did a study in which they examined uh, across a number of wastewater treatment plants. 
And because I had to show some data, I have a graph here that shows concentrations of a few of the uh, okay, that won't work. A few of the pharmaceuticals that they looked for as a, and a, the, their concentrations uh, in in these wastewater systems. The bottom line is we are detecting pharmaceuticals. And we know that there are other authorities that are, are measuring pharmaceuticals in effluent, but again, we don't have access to those data. Now, we also know that some pharmaceuticals, actually the majority of them, are degraded by wastewater treatment. But many survive the treatment. So what do we know about the Merrimack? We know that there was one publicly uh, available study that was done uh, uh, by USGS in conjunction with work by DEP, Mass DEP, but the problem was the reporting limits were too high. So, we don't have a lot of data. Good decision making needs good information, and testing needs to characterize the suite of contaminants. We can't possibly measure everything, but we need to be smart about what we do measure. And I would suggest that the analytes that we're looking for were great at the time of Sedgwick, right, back in the 1900s, early 1900s, but we can do better than that. The science tells us that there are other toxic chemicals that we need to be concerned about that we're not measuring. And we need not to run from one shiny object to the other. PFAS is a challenge. It's highly toxic. It challenges our ability to measure at very low concentrations. But we might be able to use it as an indicator. But we need to make sure that our testing strategies are comprehensive and reflect what's coming into the river. I would suggest that wastewater treatment might be that we need more sophisticated treatment on the end of the wastewater treatment pipe. But we really need an overall reduction in toxics use. And that's going to take a great effort. But again, it's about a systems approach. We need to decrease what's going on, going into the Merrimack, in addition to addressing the water that we take out. We want to be able to say, can people swim safely? Can they boat? Can they drink the water? And be confident that it's not, uh, it's not going to damage their health. And fish consumption, all I talked about was water. We didn't even mention the sediment. This is a historically contaminated river. There will be DDT, there will be PCBs. These are all toxic chemicals that we know a lot about. Once we start testing fish tissue, all bets are off. So I leave you with the hope that we can look at this systematically, that we can put our heads together, develop really robust testing protocols. We'll need to keep some of the older ones that allow our regulating colleagues to do their work under the current regulations, but we also, also need to increase our capacity to use the science for decision making. Thank you. We have maybe one question or two questions. We can, we can do it at the end. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll catch it at the end. <laughs> and as a reminder, our speakers and 11 additional experts during lunch will be at uh, tables where our little tents are, um, our table tents are, and you can dive deeper into all these topics with them at this point. So note about the sound. There is an issue with the back. It cuts in and out. Uh, so if it does cut out, let me know. We're trying to compensate by turning up the volume here. So uh, just give me some feedback uh, as we go along about whether or not you can hear what, what we're saying. We've also added some additional chairs in the back, so if people come, come in, welcome them to your table, or you can uh, go ahead and direct them to the back there. So already, let me close this one off. And... Dr. Ingham, we can start making our way up. All right. So our next speaker is Dr. Wheeler Yan. She's an associate professor who joined the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at UMass Lowell in 2019. 
Her research efforts focus on contaminant transformation mediated by earth abundant materials and reactions at natural or engineered surfaces. She pursues applications of these findings to subsurface remediation and sustainable water use and reuse. Please welcome Dr. Yan. Thank you. Um, so um, thanks, Willow, for the introduction. And uh, um, when I actually got a call from Willow about two months ago to give a talk on microplastics, I was I just said very bluntly, um, I don't think I can talk about microplastics in the Merrimack River because there is no study on that. So she said, fine, let's just um, talk in general. So I have to say that. Um, on this issue, microplastics, um, I do not know whether the sound is clear enough. I'm actually a learner. This is new to me. And so I'll just be sharing what we have learned so far from other studies in other parts of the country or worldwide. And let's look at what, how, how, how big an issue, the nature of it, and uh, what are the complexities involved. So. Um, the reason, part of the reason I can't talk much about microplastic is it's a new topic, especially in fresh water systems. And the other reason I couldn't talk about Merrimack River is um, because I'm very new to here. So I joined UMass Law uh, uh, six months ago, and uh, um, prior to that, I was in uh, another institution, which is actually very far from seashore. So. Um, when we talk about plastics, it's just like any material. Um, it has its own life cycle. So typically, you have these three big stages. You have um, production, use, and waste disposal. If it's in the perfectly sustainable world, this circle should go on and on, and it should be self-contained, meaning material is 100% contained within the circle. There is no leakage of material to, um, to the environment. But in the imperfect world, as we are now, we know that there are actually lots of plastics throughout each stages. So um, you could have lots of pallets, plastic in the form of pallets during production, during transportation and use, and most significantly um, in the waste disposal stage. So current understanding about plastics is that we have a majority of the plastic waste. When they are collected, um, they actually go to landfill rather than recycling. So uh, there are some more numbers I will share with you. Uh, being an engineer, uh, I always like to use numbers. So um, this is a very, a lot of the studies, as you can see, they are very recent, just done in few years, in the last few years. So this is actually a study done in, um, I believe it's 2017 or 16. And it was looking at the global picture of contribution of microplastics to oceans. And it's not surprising that um, the paper found out over 90% of the plastics, if you just count by mass, coming from um, countries in Asia, especially East Asia, and in Africa. So these are the countries that have seen tremendous economical growth in the past few decades. But this is also uh, where we think that waste management practice has not been fully established. So. Um, just give some numbers. Uh, so these numbers, yeah. Um, in terms of plastic, the raw plastic production, in just in 2015, uh, we have a 400 million tons. If we look at the biggest uses of plastics, um, these are the three major categories. Uh, packaging, 40%, and then um, the second biggest user is textile, followed by building and constructions. The personal care products and medical uses actually takes a smaller share, about 10%, and the rest are others, such as electronics. So um, the production of waste, we have been using um, plastics pre -pre very prevalently since World War II. So total cumulative amount, people estimate that's about 6.3 billion tons. And uh, it's estimated about 80%, close to 80%, actually eventually goes to landfill. Only 20% is either incinerator or uh, recycled. And uh, um, if 
people would actually, uh, in, in solid waste class, I often ask students to convert amount to volume for landfill. Because the biggest issue with landfill is do we have enough space to hold this waste? So that is the amount of plastic we have so far uh, disposing to landfill that is actually equivalent to the size of Manhattan if it's deep, 70 meter deep. So um, currently, um, so what this is, um, I think, uh, again, very recent numbers. What people estimate to marine environment, we have about 10 million tons per year. And uh, uh, in plastic research, microplastics research, people typically, it started as some people uh, strolling along the beach shore, uh, looking for debris, and then they collect and then just analyze by visual inspection. So in the early times, um, it's all about counting by numbers, number of pieces per um, per mass or per um, uh, meter of the shoreline. Therefore, people actually, uh, there is pretty precise numbers. Uh, it's about five trillion pieces floating on ocean overall in the world. And the majority um, actually of them are very small pieces. That is what we call microplastics. And uh, so, there is this question, why people talk about microplastic among all plastic waste? And how do we define that? So um, the reason we care about the smaller plastic pieces, there are several reasons. First of all, plastics, when it's released into the environment, it naturally, the, the size reduces with time. So there was study people track the average size of plastic litter in water over a, a decade time. And they realized significant decrease in sizes. And that, to a large extent, is attributed to weathering in nature. So you could imagine uh, wave motion, uh, so, uh, UV exposure, biological degradation are all the reasons that would break down larger pieces into smaller ones. So there is uh, the fragmentation of plastics. And uh, that actually echoes the, um, the observation people have. If you do study, um, people take samples and realize majority of the plastics they collect are very small in size, less than five millimeter. Um, so um, these plastic, these smaller pieces, in fact, is more of an environmental concern for the reason that they have more intimate contact with the ecosystem. It can be readily ingested, and it can then go into the food web and it can goes, uh, goes down along the food chain. And uh, um, another reason we are concerned about smaller plastics is that smaller pieces of material tend to have bigger surface areas. And bigger surface area, plastics are more or less hydrophobic in nature. Therefore, they repel water and they tend to be the shelter for hydrophobic things as well. And in water, we do have a lot of contaminants that would love plastic much more than uh, water. For example, talking about <laughs> persistent organic contaminants like PCBs or dioxins. So, and they could also be shelter for pathogens. So therefore, um, uh, the National Ocean, not, um, the Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration define not microplastic formally as plastic that is less than five millimeter in size. And they use this method called Mentanet to collect pieces from surface of oceans. And you probably have seen those, those devices. So it's actually, you have a piece of mat. This is the, 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 uh, the net is made of uh, fabrics. And it's, it's like a nylon fabric. The mesh size is about 300 micron. So therefore, effectively, what this method uh, captures is plastic particles between 300 micron and 5 millimeter. So it's not nanoplastics, it's micro. Um, if we look at overall um, the plastic studies, majority of them are actually looking at plastic in marine environment. This is how the problem got noticed in the early years. Um, and uh, so there are more numbers and we therefore can do some calculation and figure out what is the inventory. And people actually pretty much identify that uh, the three significant sources of marine plastic debris, they are actually uh, synthetic textiles, 
Um, and then we also see something called tire. Tire is due to um, vehicle, uh, when we drive, any distance we drive, we actually create microplastic. Because tire nowadays are made of synthetic rubber, and the erosion of tire with uh, distance with driving is a contributor, a significant contributor of the particles. And then we also have things like sodium dust. Now, personal care products, um, I believe people have heard about the banning the use of microbeads in toothpaste or facial cleaning products. That actually contributes to some extent, yeah. So, um, and uh, I did not see, uh, um, I did not actually show a very common table of plastics by their types and density. Uh, we have actually a variety of plastic material being used in our daily lives. We know polyethylene, polypropylene a lot. And these are actually tend to be the lighter ones. So their intrinsic density is lower than seawater, so they tend to flow. But there are plastics that are heavier than seawater, uh, sea so things like polycarbonate or others. And then they have a tendency to sink. And whatever we see on the surface of water, this is most of the study, as I said, is actually looking at surface water, especially seawater, uh, it's just one type of phenomenon. Those sitting at the bottom is a different kind, and we know really very little about. So, synthetic fiber, which is very interesting, you saw a lot of newspaper about that. Now, there is a little bit of discussion about whether this is primary or secondary microplastics. And the majority, I, I think the literature nowadays call them secondary. What we define as secondary is, these are not originally from the plastic product. They are breakdown products. So they are breakdown by mechanical force, UV or other actions. And um, so what's interesting about those things is, um, people realize that uh, actually the significant source of microplastics in domestic wastewater is from the washing machine. So just doing laundry yourself, you are contributing to that. And so there are study that reports the number. I would actually go on a little bit more. So, um, and the, the amount of fiber, synthetic fiber released from washing, it depends on the fiber itself. It also depends on how many times it has been washed. So the newer fabrics tend to release more and so on. So it's a very interesting uh, study. Now, um, when we actually, as I said, majority of the study on microplastic is in ocean environment. We do very, very little knowledge um, about uh, plastic in fresh water systems. There are many reasons. Um, first of all, it's actually um, it's, it's, it's less obvious a problem compared to uh, marine environment and there is also the difficulty in analyzing uh, plastics because surface environment tend to have higher natural background of solids. Teasing out microplastics from these natural solids is actually not easy. So the most well studied region is in fact the Great Lakes region. So this is a study that it compares, this is a simulation. So if you look at the first chart, this is actually the population density in Great Lakes. And the second chart, this diagram is showing the simulated density of microplastics uh, in Great Lakes. So you can see there is a matching. So population and microplastic density, they have direct correlation. And what you also notice here in this diagram is that most of the plastics, they actually tend to stay closer to the shore. So it's not homogeneous in the water, it's closer to shore, which has two sides. On the positive side, this means it's probably easier to get rid of, to collect and then just remove it. On the other hand side, this is also where the intake of drinking water treatment plants are. So you would actually have higher exposure. So um, majority, so the sources of microplastics in fresh water, we think that majority comes from wastewater discharge, urban runoff, storm water, and uh, the, other, the other two categories are just industrial or agricultural runoff and littering. And as I mentioned just now that um, 
In fact, this is this is emphasizing this study that um, they do a sink salt and the sink comparison. They realize the amount of the particles that is estimated to be floating on uh, Great Lakes is a lot less than the amount of plastics releasing to that. So that implies the majority, over 90%, actually sinks to the bottom. But there are not many studies that look at sediments. So um, I do not know in terms of time. Um, so what we have here is um, what are the important factors that can affect people. People are, um, this is just again um, some sort of um, general feelings because we do need a lot more data. Population density is definitely important. The size of the water and the, the turnover, how, the residence time of water. And there's a lot of like hydrological and climatological factors. For example, um, after storm event, for example, um, this is a, just a, a recent study showing that the effect of flooding on water, uh, my, microplastics in water, and they see actually more than 50% reduction in uh, uh, microplastic in sediments just with flooding. So, um, and then, um, so this actually highlights two things. One is the dynamic nature of it, and the other is the mobility of the plastics. So it can move with water, it can go to ocean, so it's a, it's a very dynamic and quantitative um, um, problem. And what I want to actually um, probably mention a little bit more in the last few minutes is just wastewater, the impact of wastewater and waste management practice on microplastic. So um, in wastewater, um, people have identified different kinds of uh, microplastics and predominantly, if we look at number of quantity, fiber is the highest. So the synthetic textile is the big contributor. You would actually, it's actually very easy to blame wastewater treatment plants not doing a sufficient job of removing those things. But I would say that wastewater treatment plants, they are not designed to remove microplastics. So therefore, um, if you look at it, they are not designed to move, but um, in reality, wastewater treatment plant does not matter whether it's the conventional one or the more sophisticated one. They are doing a pretty decent job of removing microplastics. So um, people, this is, this is a study that looks at several dozens of wastewater treatment plants across the whole um, world and they realized that um, in fact um, over 90 percent so if you look at the amount of microplastic in the influent versus that goes out over 90 percent is actually effectively captured as biosolids and only less than one percent one uh, what less than two percent goes to the receiving water so this is a pretty impressive but we have to remember the amount of the sheer volume of effluent going into um, the water is so huge that even this, this is just one or two percent, it can contribute a significant amount of uh, the plastic into the, uh, into the natural environment. So um, I think what I would actually probably just maybe uh, I will probably stop here. What people have learned so far about wastewater treatment um, facility is that the, the newer ones, the, those with um, modern technologies, for example, you have membrane treatment, they are much more efficient in removing microplastics than conventional ones. So there is, uh, indeed, so the newer membrane bioreactor, they are meant for other purposes, but um, uh, coincidentally, it's, it's, it brings the efficiency of removal to by an order of magnitude. Of order, uh, order of magnitude. And uh, this is actually what I want to probably stop here. Actually, um, the slides, um, I would maybe, um, what I want to mention here is just probably, I don't have a slide that show what is the relevance of microplastic to Merrimack River watershed? But based on all the studies and the knowledge we have gained so far, there are actually a few reasons we think it should be relevant. For one, one important thing is it's a river shed that's serving a huge population, uh, 600,000 people as source of drinking water. It's also receiving a significant amount of affluent from wastewater. And we have to remind of, uh, uh, that ourselves that wastewater treatment plant here, if I'm correct, majority are using conventional treatment. So there is a likelihood that uh, a pretty significant discharge is being made to the, river, uh, to the watershed. 
And there is also this interesting fact that we have a lot of historical and existing industrial activities. So they would actually would significantly impact the chemistry of the sediments, and that would lead to uh, some unique problems here. But again, since it's a new problem, um, I would just echo um, previously uh, Dinar, Campbell, uh, Dinar Campbell mentioned that the first thing we need to do is to collect more data before we jump to actions or finding engineering solutions. Looking for getting quality data is always the number one. So therefore, in terms of knowledge gap, what I put as first is in the microplastic field right now, the sampling and analysis protocols are not even homogenized. Marine ecologists and freshwater ecologists or ecosystem ecologists, they are using different approaches. And people could use, uh, for example, you could use the metanet, and they could use, all use uh, different methods such as a cylinder uh, filter unit. And the analysis is another nightmare. It's very complicated, difficult to tease out microplastic from the natural fiber, from the other environmental backgrounds. So therefore, um, this is the number one task we actually need to look on, and I'm also looking at it in a more recent project. And the other questions, other important questions, we do not understand much about the transport behavior. How does it transport from a coarse water compartment? What are the inventories? Uh, what other sources and things? Are they balanced? Can we put up a mass balance for microplastics? And what are the sensitive habitats? Which one should we prioritize on? And then environmental behavior, how does they degrade in environment, and how long they tend to stay, the size, how do it change, how does the property change with time. And lastly, and most, also most importantly, is how do, how do we interact with the biota, the organisms, and the eco-environment. This is not just short-term. So plastics, by nature, they are relatively inner. They do not cause significant toxicologic effect uh, in the short term, but the long term effect is a lot more, um, it, it's it, the long term direct and indirect effect is what we are actually, we know very few, uh, very little about, and it is also something that would take much, much more time to actually gather a very um, accurate knowledge about. So with that, I would actually, um, I will stop here, and there, uh, um, We'll be happy to actually see if any comments on that. Any questions? Oh, you have one back here. I will let you speak and I will load up the next person. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Yen, for a really informative uh, presentation. You mentioned that 90% or more of the microplastics are removed at wastewater treatment plants. What happens then to the sludge? Does it get incinerated or used as a soil amendment? So that is a very good question. How does the sludge, uh, what is the fate of microplastic in the final sludge? Um, well, a uh, majority of, it really depends on how that is managed in different regions. So um, anybody is in the solid waste industry, uh, typically sludge is, nowadays probably I would say it was not so common that you can directly apply a soil amendment. A lot of them actually has to go to either uh, landfill or other kind of disposal. Just because the, the, the concern over um, um, you know the, um, the, the the micro pollutants in sludge, yes. Um, both the speakers so far have talked about um, data and collection, and it seems to me there are a number of places where data ought to be easily collected, like the water intake for water treatment plants. Uh, we have the Wall Experimental Station in Lawrence, which actually started because of the typhoid they were talking about earlier. Um, how do we get those facilities, which are already in place, already doing testing, to test the things that you think are really critical for improving the water supply? And then one last question. Back in the 70s, you know, when we first got the water treatment plants or late 80s, um, a lot of people were concerned we taking care of the the uh, point source pollution, but what about the non-point source pollution, agricultural runoff, and nobody seems to be talking about that anymore. So that is a very good point that um, with data collection, other than you collecting field data, one important thing is actually going to waste, uh, drinking water and wastewater treatment plant, look at the intake 
and look at the affluence and compare. Um, so actually, um, we actually have some early lab uh, activities that is more of using very we call that artificial sample. So it's like we add microplastic into sand or other medium to try to see if we can tease out them effectively. And once that actually that, that method itself is not mature, it's so new that people are exploring different methods. So with a relatively well-established protocol, then the next thing would be to set up uh, routine monitoring and uh, data collection uh, at important um, um, at the important entry as well as um, the, the, the uh, uh, I would say, uh, the important uh, 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 sampling, uh, the reception points of different uh, uh, water systems. So uh, the, I would say that um, the, uh, the monitoring station that has been set up by the drinking water, is that water, wastewater treatment plant, those will actually serve as a very simple, uh, very, very convenient platform for such activities. Yeah. So, thank you. Our next speaker is Greg Coyle. He is an environmental engineer at the Lowell Regional Wastewater Utility, where he works to improve water quality through implementation of Lowell's environmental monitoring and stormwater management programs. He is also a research assistant in Tufts University's PhD program for environmental and water resources engineering focusing on modeling and software tools for integrated water resources management. Please welcome Greg Coyle. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Hi. Thank you. Um, so the risk of eating into my own time a little bit, I actually wanted to address... Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to address that last question very briefly. How can drinking water utilities and wastewater utilities assist in collecting or filling some of these data gaps? Um, and so at Lowell, we do collaborate with researchers at the University of Massachusetts in Lowell. Um, we have an external sampling program that you know if people want to sample. Um, we work to collaborate with them. And what's really needed though is an organizing framework throughout the watershed to make sure that all of the various thanks, all of the various um, data uh, analysis projects that are underway are going through a consistent review process for you know, what's being collected, when, why, at what frequency, and making sure that that data gets into a centralized database so it can be assessed by multiple different researchers who have different perspectives. So to the extent that uh, water and wastewater utilities can help with that, I think most of us would be more than willing to, but there needs to be an organizing framework for that. And I think that that's really why we're all in this room to try and make that happen. So um, in addition, I just wanted to kind of give, before I start here, um, you know, from a municipal perspective, what does all of this look like? It's really refreshing to uh, to hear these perspectives from Dr. Heidi Bernays and um, all the other speakers. And yeah, thank you. I'm not sure I get that. Um, From the, thank you, from the municipal perspective in Lowell, we're dealing with managing the flood protection system, the wastewater collection and treatment system, and the stormwater system, and meeting permit requirements for all of those systems, making sure they keep operating correctly, making sure they're maintained well. We have 50 employees and eight engineers in the technical group supporting operations and maintenance, so we really need to be focused on that, and to the extent that we can take on additional monitoring projects, and you know, we, we do what we can, but um, I think you all want us to be focused on meeting the existing requirements and work with others collaboratively to look at emerging contaminants, not add more to uh, distract us from keeping focused on uh, keeping everything running well. So to do that, um, if we can establish an overall watershed framework um, through continuing the discussion with our legislators as advocates 
and as practitioners all working together, that's probably the best thing that can come out of uh, this forum, I think. So, all that said, I'm really here to talk about bacteria monitoring, which we've done in the river um, from 2018 and 2019. And I just wanted to share some of that data with you, some of the uh, findings and next steps that we're hoping to implement. So, again, I uh, attended Northeastern University before I started working in oil wastewater. And once I started working in oil wastewater, they asked me to start studying the river. And I started working with some researchers at Tufts University and eventually enrolled into the program where I'm continuing to really make that my academic focus. So what I'm talking about here is not just my job at Lowell, it's also my uh, dissertation material. Um, so just a quick overview, which bacteria are we talking about and why? Uh, where does it come from? When is it safe to fish, swim, paddle, or look at the river? Uh, and how can we better understand the answers to these questions? So bacteria is a very broad term. It's an entire domain of life forms, and many of them are essential to life as we know it. Specifically, pathogens are particular bacteria that, um, bacteria, viruses, or protozoans that can cause disease. Um, so as I believe uh, Dr. Hibernais showed the um, privy into Stony Brook, that was the location of the 1890 typhoid outbreak that killed over 100 people in Lowell. Um, so these pathogens clearly are dangerous, and that's why our industry was created to try and prevent such disasters from happening. Um, indicator species are particular types of bacteria that are commonly present with pathogens, but they're easier to measure, and they're not necessarily harmful themselves. These include total coliforms, fecal coliforms, E. coli for fresh water, and enterococci for marine waters. So specifically what I'm talking about here and the data I'm showing you is E. coli. Um, and so these bacteria, all of them really are normally prevalent in the intestines and excrement of warm-blooded animals. Um, they're not usually pathogenic. There are some strains of E. coli that are enterotoxic. Um, and so I was curious, of how many waterborne outbreaks are there in Massachusetts? So that's putting my slides together. And I'm not sure that this is a comprehensive summary, but the National Outbreak Reporting System from CDC lists three outbreaks in Massachusetts since 2009. Um, they don't attribute the cause or exact location of the outbreak. But I just want to put these up here because it, it does demonstrate that you know, we do have waterborne outbreaks still, and um, you know, we need to do as much as we can to prevent those from happening through you know, proper treatment and notification, and we're trying to do the best we can to improve that in all as we can. So where do these bacteria come from? Of course, combined sewer overflows, uh, stormwater runoff, livestock and pet waste, wildlife, we also have failing septic systems, uh, landfills, and boat and marina wastes. And just as important as where does it come from is where does it go? Um, so, predominantly this gets transported out to the ocean. It can settle to the sediments and it can die off and otherwise decay uh, or deactivate in the water column as it moves. So, a very rough model, trying to avoid mathematics as much as possible. Uh, removal is approximated by the flow plus the settling plus the decay in the system. So, when is the river safe to use? When do these um, purging parameters cleanse the water enough to uh, let us go back into it. Um, this was part of our discussions and our CSO notifications. You know, people want to know, really, when can they go back in? But we don't really have a great way of saying that. We're looking at what other people say, and 24 to 72 hours is the standard response. But the reality is this is dynamic, as I just showed you. This depends on rates of flow, decay, which is dependent on temperature, humidity, sunlight, all these factors. Uh, in addition, not all risks are attributable to CSO discharges. So, solely going by when CSOs occur does not necessarily mean that it's 100% uh, safe to go in the water, that you're actually not going to contract a waterborne um, infection. So we really need robust monitoring to know with reasonable certainty when it's safe to go in the water and engage in recreational activities. 
So as an initial pass of this, in 2018 and 2019, we established a bacteria monitoring program from the Chelmsford Lowell line to Lawrence. And we conducted sampling during wet and dry weather, both before, during, and after CSO events. We collected uh, samples at up to 20 locations and over CSO volumes ranging from two and a half million gallons for a storm to 11 million gallons. So this is just a brief overview of the locations where on the left we have the uh, Lowell Chelmsford line, that location MR00 is the water treatment plant intake for Lowell. And then we move through the city where we take multiple samples from bridges um, where we have multiple loads coming in and then we spread out a little bit more to look at the response in the system as uh, we get away from the city. <coughs> so on the extreme right, we have MR12 and MR13, which is uh, above and below the Essex Dam and Lawrence, respectively. And here is a you know, bird's eye view of what we found, or observed rather. Um, the red dashed line that you see there is the single sample maximum reference criteria, uh, so the 235 um, colonies per 100 milliliter uh, at which you know, normally beaches are closed. Um, and the coloring on this plot is categorizing the data into um, blue boxes in which it had rained within the past 48 hours and orange boxes in which it had been dry um, and we can see a clear trend where obviously there's increased bacteria um, during wet weather. But what I find particularly uh, heartening about this plot is that it shows that for the most part during dry weather we're well below that uh, reference guideline. And of course you can also see a rise right around um, Lowell as we have those stormwater inputs and CSO inputs. So we'll take a, a little bit closer look at some of these uh, discrete locations and events over time. And this is MR0, which again is at the Lowell Water Treatment Plant at the Lowell Chelmsford Line. And the line up top there is that single sample reference uh, criteria. And this was particularly nice to see that um, even during wet weather, we're not seeing bacteria values, E. coli values, above the guideline and many of these events were conducted during wet weather events that also contributed to CSOs or wet weather bypasses um, in upstream communities. So regardless of whatever effects those discharges may have locally, we're not seeing a strong signal in E. coli at low. So these purging parameters are removing it before it gets there to the best of our ability to interpret this data. Okay, let me get to MR7, which is just downstream from the Lowell Wastewater Treatment Plant, right at the Lowell Drake line. And here we can see some clear excursions. Again, the, the scale on the vertical axis here is logarithmic. So uh, the top line there, 10 to the fourth, that's uh, units of 10,000 um, decreasing down to uh, um, 100 just below that red line. And then MR9, which is um, at Pine Island, right near the Tewksbury Water Treatment Plant intake. Um, here again, we see the wet weather, dry weather um, correlation, and we also see that the, the peaks are um, higher, but they do return very quickly um, down below the line. So in that first cluster, we have a response where bacteria levels go up rapidly, but then the next cluster over, um, during the post-event sampling, it returned relatively quickly to um, below the, the reference guideline. And then at MR12, the uh, Essex Dam. So now we see these same events, the concentrations downstream in Essex, the peaks are lower, um, but they do the duration is spread out longer. So that's the, the effect of dispersion as the load travels and spreads out through the river. Um, so that's a quick summary of what we have seen in the river and what did we learn from it? What can we say? 
Well, 24 to 72 hours. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, again, these, uh, these are dynamic loads, these are dynamic system, and going out and sampling uh, manually uh, during and after every storm is really not practical. It's not what we should be focusing on. We should be focusing on keeping the um, operations of the plants uh, up to date and moving forward. So we need help really to implement a more robust monitoring program uh, so that we can know whether it's safe to use the river with reasonable certainty. So there is some more that we're gonna do to try and improve our knowledge of this and collaborate with all you folks here on um, getting that robust monitoring plan in place. Um, so some other challenges, just to, real quick. Um, with respect to sampling manually. Uh, sampling is expensive um, during wet weather conditions. You have to go out over time during wet weather. You know, these things don't happen from seven to three. Uh, the time to result for samples is 18 hours minimum from sample collection. And if you're using contract laboratories, it's 20 to 30 days before you get the results back. So what, what good is the data if, uh, you know, 24 to 72 hours, we know it's okay, probably to go back in 20 to 30 days later. It's really just a, a report for the database at that point. So really we need new technology to be able to um, inform the public and ourselves about how this system is responding to dynamic events. Luckily, that was just invented. Um, a company in France called Fluidian uh, invented an in-situ or in-place autonomous bacterial pathogen sensor for water quality environmental monitoring. Uh, this is a really, really neat tool, and we just got one, so I'm excited to play with it this year. Um, basically, it consists of seven uh, mini bioreactors, which the bioreactor itself is on the left there, um, and there's a schematic drawing just below it. And essentially, this draws in sample from uh, below the device when it was deployed. It mixes it with a reagent so that it growing bacteria will fluoresce, and then it measures the time to fluorescence. And once it gets that measurement, it can report back the um, concentration of bacteria in the water. It does that through telemetry, um, cellular network, um, and then the agency running such a program could then put that information onto the internet through ArcGIS Online or something like that. Um, so this is an example of the fluorescence change over the course of the sample. Uh, essentially from left to right, the sample is taken, it starts to incubate. Uh, the fluorescence initially draws down during that incubation process and then where that dashed line is in the middle of the chart, it's where the bacteria take off and start growing. Um, the people who invented this were really clever and recognized that this is essentially what we're doing when we use similar methods in the laboratory. We just wait and count the bacteria in the sample afterwards. They correlated the time to fluorescence with the end result. So as soon as you see that fluorescence happening, you can project outwards what the result is going to be. And this is um, how they were able to calibrate with laboratory values to um, the instrument values, which is on the horizontal axis. Um, and by the way, this is all from the Journal of Applied Microbiology, and sources are at the end of my presentation, which is available to everyone if you want to read more about this. Um, this is a time series of using this equipment on the Marne in France, where they did extensive deployment and testing of this, and the black values are the laboratory measurements uh, taken alongside the sampler, where the gray dashed lines and diamonds in the background are the measurements taken in real time by the instrument. Uh, if you can see it, yeah, it looks better on there. Um, the gray periods and bars, vertical bars in the background, those are rate events, so you can see the uh, response um, during rate events in the MAR as bacteria flushes in and then the system purges it. So hopefully, um, sooner than later, we can have similar plots of what's going on in there, like this. Um, 
So we are deploying the first alert system in the Merrimack this spring. We're going to be testing the communications protocols and maintenance procedures. Um, we're also assisting the company with getting US EPA approval for this. It's not currently an EPA approved method, but they need case studies in order to approve it, so we're helping with that as much as we can. And then in addition, um, as I mentioned, we really want to focus on uh, helping to develop online reporting tools to share this information with the public um, and continue to collaborate with the regional groups and agencies to advance a program like this for the entire watershed. Um, that are my sources, as I said, and happy to take any questions. As a recreational user of the river, I am terribly impressed with Lowell's efforts to collect data on the, uh, the details. 24 to 72 hours is still a very crude uh, thing, so I would hope that your next step is going to be to do some model building. When you have enough data, you can build some models that will predict where the contaminated plume is as a function of river flow, and you can inform the public of something much more accurate than 24 to 72 hours about using certain sections of the river. Are you uh, envisioning that kind of model building and prediction? I am certainly envisioning it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't say that Lowell can take that on because you know, a dynamic uh, model of the river is certainly beyond the scope of you know, Lowell's little view of yeah, the so, who's doing there, so. so we have the Army Corps model, which was developed over um, you know, the course of this century, really. Um, it's uh, the most comprehensive study and modeling effort of the river to be done. And I don't think that we should um, disregard that model just because it's been completed. We should make use of it. And where I see uh, you know, an integrated decision framework agency for the watershed should you know, get uh, approval from Army Corps to maintain and manage that model and do exactly what you're suggesting. I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Yes, hi. Uh, it's impressive that you talked about all the sampling you're doing for bacteria, but I can't seem to wrap my head around the fact that given what's been in the news in the past few months, that Lowell really hasn't taken the time to address the PFASs that you folks accepted from Turnkey Landfill, given the fact that, as I understand, you have an ISO 14000 program that says that you will pledge to keep the Merrimack River clean as for, for all users. And it would seem to me that since you're allowing these harmful forever chemicals that are coming through the waterway, that you're actually conducting greenwashing. So given also the fact that you know, you're looking to have the watershed work with you, why leave out something as important as that in, in, your, uh, in your review? I would think that you would want to be upfront and transparent about letting people know about your forever chemicals, because that is something that you basically were dinged by both Congressman McGovern and Senator Markey, who basically forced you to stop accepting that. So can you address that, please? Sure, I'd be happy to address that. Um, so the issue of PFAS is new, right? I mean, the knowledge of the chemical and its potential to cause problems, its health risks is documented, but the regulatory framework has not caught up with that knowledge yet. So as I said in my preface, we're really focused on making sure that our operation and maintenance of the collection system, our treatment system, the other infrastructure we manage is running and meeting regulatory obligations. We don't have the resources to study every new emerging contaminant. That's why we really need uh, a regional body to address what needs to be studied, how it should be studied, where that information should be held, and given a framework to acquire that information and then tell the wastewater treatment plants what the new regulatory requirements should be, 
we'll be more than happy to meet them. And as usual, we'll share that information through our um, public discharge monitoring reports. Mindy is setting up on the producer. So our next speaker is Mindy Mesmer. She's an environmental scientist and former New Hampshire State Representative. Oh, did you have a comment? Oh, sorry. Thank you very much, Mindy. I just um, I wanted to just comment on the information that Greg has put out as it pertains to the combined sewer overflow legislation. So, of course, you know the the big question is how do you measure volume, and you don't want to be um, alarming individuals up and down the river when um, there is no need for alarm um, because that becomes another important issue that um, we want to make sure that we cover it. In other words, you can't cry wolf um, all the time for something that's not critically important um, to the citizens that are on the river. So you can't measure volume at this point. And believe me, there's a lot of efforts underway to try and um, be able to do that. And that's one of the infrastructure needs that we're working on um, with our federal partners. That being said, this technology um, is is critical and this testing is critical of this model everyone is looking at it um, to see if it can we can get results um, from these tests um, that also being said because we can't measure volume what we're doing at this point in the combined sewer overflow legislation is requiring that we post when the CSO ends because that's the only real data point that citizens can use to make an assessment of whether they want to go out on the river. Um, you know, you'll get some information about volume, you'll get some information about when the CSO ends, but that's a very crude um, measurement. But that's the best we have right now until we can measure, and so this technology um, is critical to us moving forward on this issue, and I, I, I want to thank Greg for this initiative. Thank you. So our next speaker is Mindy Messmer. She's an environmental scientist and former New Hampshire State Representative. Mindy was elected after exposing a pediatric cancer cluster and went on to pass important legislation to keep arsenic and PFAS out of drinking water. She is a member of the Pease Restoration Advisory Board and four New Hampshire legislative commissions. She recently received the Elsie Hillman National Speaker Award from Less Cancer on Capitol Hill. Mindy is a founding member of New Hampshire State Water Alliance and is currently running for Governor's Executive Council in New Hampshire. Please welcome Mindy Messmer. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you for allowing me to speak about this important issue here in uh, about the Merrimack River. Uh, so as, uh, as she said, I got involved with this issue in 2014, actually, I've been 30 years an environmental consultant, uh, working for a variety of industry partners, uh, DOD, um, from small gas stations uh, to very large 30-site, multi-site investigations on DOD properties. And one day my son came home from school and told me that one of his friends at school was very sick in our town, and um, several of the kids were worried about it and started getting calls from moms. Um, turns out that his friend um, unfortunately lost his battle with cancer just last year, and we have several other people in our community that have died from these rare forms of cancer. So that was my intro, my introduction into uh, legislative life when I I uh, found this issue, I reported it to the state in 2014 and 2016. The Department of Health and Human Services acknowledged that it was a cancer cluster. And at the time, uh, it, a series of things happened. Our governor then, Maggie Hassan, started a task force, which I was asked to serve on, to look for environmental triggers for the cancers. And then my current state rep asked me to run to replace him, which is something I would never considered as a 30-year scientist and mother and a small business owner. Uh, but I did run and did get elected. I went to the State House to try to figure out what kind of factors might be contributing to these cancer cases. Um, I also de determined that our state of New Hampshire has the highest rate of pediatric cancer in the nation. We have the highest rate of bladder cancer, the highest rate of breast cancer, and the highest rate of esophageal cancer. 
in the nation in New Hampshire. So these are very concerning facts, uh, which I then went to try to unravel. Um, participated in a several other um, commissions that were formed by my bills that were passed in my first year in the state legislature. Went out to pass a couple of other really important measures. Total 15 bills passed in two years that I was in the state legislature, which went to determining the causes of these cancers and, and other things, but also protecting our drinking water from arsenic and things like PFAS, which has been, I heard, brought up a few times already. So I'm going to delve right into PFAS. This has been one of the biggest things I've dealt with in the state of New Hampshire. PFAS chemicals are perfluoroalkyl chemicals. They're in things like um, rain jackets. They're in these foams that are used to put out gasoline um, fires at airports and, and the DOD uses. Um, they're in lots of different products. The problem with them is once they get in the environment, it's very difficult and expensive to remove them. Once they get in your body, we, we don't know ways to get them out of your body and they accumulate in your body with continued exposure. Even after you stop exposure to these chemicals, some of them can remain in your body, we think, for up to 12 years before they're half the concentration that they are 12 years before. They were introduced in 1946 in commercial and, and um, other products. Um, DuPont used them in things like Scotchgard, um, and it was discovered by accident. Now we have day-to-day -day exposures to PFAS and all sorts of uh, products like ski wax, we just found out recently. Um, lots of personal care products, drinking water in particular is the most concerning. But we're also finding now that they're accumulating crops uh, in places where there have been air emissions that contaminate the ground, and they're in fish and livestock and lots of um, food packaged products. We also know that they're in uh, lots of wrappers for fast food items and lots of packaged products you buy, including uh, um, microwave popcorn bags, the interior of them. The sources of drinking water contamination I mentioned, we think drinking water is actually the way that most people uh, accumulate most of these products in their body. Um, they are um, from exposure to um, the drinking water gets contaminated by the AFFF foams, like I, I mentioned which are at Air Force bases and airports, but also um, industry and, and production of uh, some of these products, including some of the Kevlar vests that our first responders wear. We're also finding that they're in wastewater, and this kind of sideways, a good segue from the previous speaker, uh, the wastewater and the biosolids generated from the wastewater treatment systems uh, that are then spread on uh, biosolids are spread on fields and things, which we thought was a good idea for a long time, but we're finding now is not so great an idea because the solids are actually heavily concentrated in PFAS. Um, and also in landfills, which is another thing which someone mentioned earlier. So much so, they've been used and introduced into our um, products, everyday products, that now uh, pretty much every single baby born in the United States has some level of PFAS in their blood detected in their body. In 1999, the NHANES, which is a large um, 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 random selection of, blood, of people to be blood tested, 98% of those people over the age of 12 had some level of PFAS in their body. This became a, a big issue. You may have heard of the movie Dark Waters, which was just out in the, the theaters over the, uh, maybe still here in, in Massachusetts, uh, through a lawsuit against 3M where this attorney, Rob Bellot, uh, really uncovered the industry suppression of this information for decades, and it's an ongoing thing right now. Uh, really important connected to that lawsuit, there was a large, what epidemiologists call the gold standard study, was done on 69,000 people exposed in West Parker's, uh, in um, West Parker's, uh, Parkersburg, West Virginia. Uh, where they detected probable links between exposure to these PFAS chemicals in drinking water with certain kinds of cancer, with certain kinds of other chronic disease like preeclampsia um, and other um, ulcerative colitis and um, uh, high cholesterol. And this science is now evolving way more. I would, I would contend that it's not anymore emerging. We pretty much know about the bad effects of, these, uh, of exposure to these chemicals in products and in drinking water. And so there are some really, um, there are some really relevant um, examples of how these have ended up, and these are the things I've worked on in the past few years. There's a Superfund site right smack in the middle of the cancer cluster geographically. 
that um, has been there since the late 1960s and was used by the DOD. We think probably AFFF phones were disposed in there. Very high levels of PFAS are ending up into all of the brooks that uh, start adjacent to this landfill running throughout the seacoast of New Hampshire. A very important issue that I've been dealing with. There's also air emissions associated with St. Gobain performance plastics in the central part of New Hampshire, um, which is Merrimack has contaminated, uh, I think, five towns now, uh, drinking water from the air emissions of these PFAS chemicals. And importantly, you know, we have only begun to really look at regulating about two of these. Some states like Massachusetts has been pretty proactive in looking at regulating up to six of these chemicals. But we have found now EPA went in to analyze what's coming out of those stacks in Merrimack, and up to 190 of these PFAS chemicals are being emitted every single day still from this plant. So we are trying to pay vir play virtual catch up with the industry on, on regulating these chemicals and understanding the health effects associated with them, and we're far behind. You probably heard, I think this was mentioned in the previous speaker, that some Landfill leachate coming from New Hampshire was being brought down 100,000 gallons a day to Lowell and was uh, being put in the Merrimack River. That stopped two days later when uh, it was broken the previous two days in the, in the Boston Globe. So this is a very real issue, not just this particular landfill, but there are very, a lot of landfills across the state of New Hampshire that are doing similar things, and they are ending up in our surface water bodies right now. There's also a mention made of the sludge. Um, so the biosolid sludge also has tested very high for these PFAS chemicals, and this one in particular in Maine, uh, this is only one example, there have been several across the nation now, where these sludges have contaminated drinking water. This man um, had his cows also contaminated by PFAS, and he has to get rid of a thousand cows now. And uh, his own blood is contaminated with these PFAS chemicals. This is a very real, issue that has a lot of different um, factors that we still have to get ahead of. So my plan of attack has been to attack this on a very a, a lot of different um, avenues. Coalition building of the public um, to advocate for legislation. We have um, had task forces and commissions which have got people to the table to sort of bring people along to help them understand this. And also through legal action, um, we, um, several of us were involved in a lawsuit against the Copley Landfill um, Superfund site responsible party, and we won in Superior Court, but they had to let us know it's a hybrid um, entity, it's partial public, mostly um, controlled by the public entities and municipalities, so we uh, won that case in that they have to let us know what's going on, we have to be included in meetings. Um, and also legislation to try to compel action on the state levels. This is really important because, as we know, not much is happening on the federal level right now. So thankful to all of our state representatives who are really taking these issues on because that's, I think, the way that we're going to make any change um, right now with respect to these chemicals. So we formed New Hampshire Safe Water Alliance in 2016. A very um, important um, part of how we've made a lot of progress in the state of New Hampshire uh, when we put out a notice to our membership to send emails to senators and house members in the state of New Hampshire, our voices are heard when 350 emails go in 48 hours to the senators and they say, whoa, <laughs> what are we doing here? So they pay attention to what we say now. Uh, and so I kind of talked about this. So the policy based on the science has been a big part of the work that I've done. Um, unfortunately, we do have a lot of opposition on the other side. This is where advocacy is really important. We have a lot of um, uh, opposition from industry leaders, from industry associations in the state of New Hampshire who want to keep us from passing these um, laws that are very important to protect our drinking water. So what we tried to do was just go brute force and go at the standards for arsenic and PFAS, but PFAS in particular is what I'm going to talk about here. Um, we did have to um, deal with some incremental successes, but the first year I tried this, I failed in my first couple of attempts to get a PFAS drinking water standard in New Hampshire. But uh, the failure was actually a positive thing, because at least we had people starting to talk about it. And when I joined the legislature in 2016, no one even knew what PFAS was, much less how we were going to regulate it. So I'd say in three years, we're pretty successful in coming up with some enforceable standards. Um, in the state of New Hampshire, we have the strictest standards, um, enforceable standards now passed, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but um, so I'm happy that we've achieved a lot of success in a sh fairly short amount of time. Uh, but we've also had some commissions going on so that has brought some people along 
with us that were first um, against us. I'll just pass over this. Um, so my first, my second year in the legislature, we got this SB 309 passed. And the important thing about this bill was that it required the state to come up with maximum enforceable drinking water standards for PFAS with this very important phrase in it. And no matter what happened in our negotiations to get this bill passed, I refused to remove this very important phrase. And I think um, it was very important. I knew at the time, and most of the people I was negotiating with didn't understand why this was so important. But to protecting uh, the most vulnerable, which are the prenatal and the early childhood, I knew the science was developing in this area. So this ended up in the final version, which then ended up with the state of New Hampshire initially proposed standards equal to the EPA's advisory limits, which are 70 parts per trillion total for two of the PFAS. Um, so that was similar to what they initially proposed, but right in the middle of our rulemaking process, this very important study came out from the state of Minnesota which really shows some really concerning levels of PFAS chemicals being delivered to babies just before they're born and after they're born through contaminated drinking water and through prenatal exposure uh, and from breast milk. So this is what caused the state of New Hampshire then to go back to the drawing board and use this model that was created to come down quite a bit by about, um, I'd say, a tenth of what the initial proposals were and ended up being our um, proposed final drinking water standards, and you can see this chart shows New Hampshire's MCLs, final MCLs on the left. It shows them compared to US <coughs> EPA oh, and EPA's numbers to the right, and Massachusetts to the right. Massachusetts actually is being very proactive, and hopefully they'll pass those. Um, the cumulative total of six PFAS will have to be less than 20 parts per trillion, which is really great. Um, so they, they're actually, Massachusetts is on the forefront of really looking at regulating more of these chemicals out of what we know is 5,000 that exist on the market. I should add that unfortunately on the day after these standards were implemented in New Hampshire, uh, 3M, one of the manufacturers, along with uh, Plymouth Water and Sewer District and a couple other uh, biosolids um, companies, uh, put a, uh, a lawsuit into our superior court system to block implementation of the standards. That's still very much underway right now, and uh, we are still fighting to make sure that those standards come back into play. It's now been appealed to the Supreme Court in New Hampshire, and uh, we are very actively involved in trying to make sure that these standards become get implemented again. But there's also a lot of activity in the state now, because through all these commissions and all this other work we've done, we now have a lot of bipartisan support in the state of New Hampshire. So I'm very encouraged that, that, uh, that we will be able to circumvent that lawsuit and actually re-implement those standards through writing into statute. So keep tuned on that. So here's a, now a bunch of people have um, been implementing, <clears throat> have been putting a lot of work into uh, legislation that I'm helping with in the state of New Hampshire, my colleagues that um, <clears throat> are still working in the state. We have a medical monitoring bill, which has now passed through the House. We'll go to the Senate this session. Hopefully, we'll get that passed. But again, a lot of industry opposition to this. We want to make sure that the people are exposed to these chemicals in our communities, have an avenue for getting their medical monitoring done so that they know what to expect and how to treat those illnesses they may eventually develop. Uh, we now have a registry coming up um, for AFFF foam use in the state of New Hampshire, which is really important. We need to understand where these foams have been used and are being used so we know where potentials for drinking water contamination exist. And there are a couple of other um, bills, as you can see here, particularly the bottled water bill is interesting that is going to be heard today in a subcommittee in the state of New Hampshire again. Uh, we just want to know that the bottled water sold in New Hampshire, a um, is um, conforms with the state of New Hampshire standards for drinking water since we have some of the most stringent standards and you would not believe the opposition <laughs> that we're getting from um, bottled water companies. So once it crosses the state lines, we want to make sure that it conforms with our state standards. It doesn't have to right now, so that's an important factor. Um, lots of other issues going on in New Hampshire. I don't want to take too much time, but would happy be happy to entertain any questions anyone has. the uh, town of Ipswich, Massachusetts, and we have a wonderful tradition every summer uh, where all the, all the kids 
uh, line up on the field, and then they take the fire trucks and they shoot foam down on the kids, and they slide around in the foam. I'm wondering, is that the same foam that you're talking about that they use on air at airports? Hi, we've been studying that problem, um, and it happens in a number of places. It used to be the foam, particularly in Massachusetts. It was well, it was the the A triple F foam. It is not any longer in Massachusetts. The fire foam has been bought back by the state. So past practices potentially problematic. Current not. I actually don't know why you would spray kids with foam. <laughs> anyway, it's fun, but it's irritating through the eyes and it causes rashes. So anyway, I I, I know that. <laughs> It, it, it is still happening in New Hampshire as well. Well, thank you very much. Oh, one more. Jeff Daly. Thanks for your presentation, Mindy. Uh, you, we just talked about the foam in Barnstable uh, on the Cape. They have found kids who were playing in the AFFF foam with cancers. And it has hurt the whole watershed out there. And they don't know what to do. I, my question to you, Cindy, we had the PFAS conference with the EPA two years ago. Yet nothing has been done. What can we do to stop it? I asked Dr. Peter. Peter Cravet and the then administrator, Alexander Dunn. Let's put it to zero until proven wrong. What is your opinion? Well, like I said, we have taken a lot of aggressive steps in the state of New Hampshire, as has Massachusetts, to regulate these chemicals. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of um, um, ability to affect things on the national level right now. We are trying. We continue to have really great relationships with our New Hampshire federal representatives, and they continue to try to do things, but they are not as successful. So it's up to the states to be very proactive. And I would encourage everyone to get involved in supporting your legislators and you know, advocating for change, which is really important. In the state of New Hampshire, we have 400 representatives in our state house, uh, but, um, and they do listen to us um, to um, that as we try to support this legislation, but you know, I think, uh, as I mentioned, we took incremental steps. We, I decided not to intervene in the proposed the downgraded the standards that were much more strict when the Minnesota st <coughs> study came out. I could have made them go lower, but um, we decided to take what we could at the time as an incremental step in the right direction. And now, the, when the um, the bill coming out next week, we'll write them into statute. We have a sense that we have an ability in there to reevaluate every year, I think it is, or something. So, as we go, um, we'll take the wins as we go, and then we'll continue to fight for the for more standards. Thank you so much. But water bans really shouldn't be happening, and it's not just the average citizen that is to blame for the water ban. It, it goes all the way up to the municipalities and how we handle our water as well. So stormwater runoff is the number one cause of coastal pollution and a direct result of water falling on impervious surfaces. This right here is in Arlington. I'm going to tell you, and if anybody in this room has a head like mine, a raindrop falls at 20 miles per hour. I can, I can attest to that. Arlington is a very hilly town. So the water, the storm water, actually picks up speed, and in this picture you can see, causes damage. It tears up the asphalt. And then what they do is they patch the asphalt, and then we get another big rain event, and that patch is gone. So instead, you know, we just keep putting band-aids on things. So these are just examples. Anybody who's seen um, Finding Nemo knows that all drains lead to the ocean. And we talked about that as well. Uh, and the Merrimack also leads to the ocean. But over here we have uh, what a Boston snowbank looks like in the spring after it disappears. And all the irresponsible dog owners. And um, so there are multiple 
contributors to, to the problem. So here we go, just so we get on the same page, we'll go through just a couple of definitions and you know, what is stormwater? It originates from rainwater or runoff um, <clears throat> that runs across the land and is unable to infiltrate. And as it goes along the ground, as we've just been talking about, it picks up all, sort of, all sorts of pollutants. Here is as I was saying, currently we have our gray infrastructure. The gray infrastructure which was designed to take water and send it away. We have not found the away yet, so this is where it becomes a problem. But the idea was to separate it and get it away as soon as possible. We've already gone over this almost ad nauseum this morning, so you're all aware of it. Um, <clears throat> combined sewer overflow, which is what we have, especially in this old, the oldest part of the country, and it is well outdated. So what I'm going to offer you, who deal in this end of the world, is a way that you can kick the can down the road just a little bit longer and hold on to those antiquated systems until you can get enough money to bring them up to speed. <clears throat> the objective of the combined sewer overflow is actually noble because you want to take all that storm water and all that sewage and you want to treat it before releasing it rather than just dumping it into the water. It's a noble, it's a noble approach. Unfortunately, the, with the, the amount of the storms that we have in the antiquated system, it's not working. Like I said, we've already been over all this. So the impacts of gray infrastructure, well, we lead, we leads to CSO events and uh, <laughs> poor water quality. So we don't even have to go into that. This is what we want to go into, and this is where I'm actually kind of rushing because I do want your questions. This is where I'm finding the answer. The idea behind green infrastructure is to restore Mother Nature's natural system, to bring back the hydrological cycle and to treat water where it falls. So instead of collecting it and putting a whole lot of water through a pipe and sending it to the mythical away, we're going to treat it where it falls, let it land there and be filtered there and make its way into the ground like Mother Nature intended from the start. So through green infrastructure, we have infiltration, filtration, storage, evaporation, and transpiration. We get water quality treatment, flow control. We create and restore habitat. It's so much more aesthetically pleasing than just your standard storm drain and your gray infrastructure. And we are also able to stack functions because with green infrastructure, we're not only handling our stormwater problem, but through evaporation and evapotranspiration, we can also mitigate the heat island effect, which I know because I used to live in Haverhill for a while. Anybody in Lawrence, it's an extremely paved city, and the heat island effect is very real there. So here, you know, here are the objectives. You can read these, but what really what, what we're talking about is we're trying to reduce impervious surface, which can, you know, which can happen over time, it can have to happen selectively. But again, we are trying to get back to um, restoring Mother Nature's systems in kind of a technological way, and again, manage stormwater near where it falls. So instead of having to manage gallons and gallons and gallons as it goes through a pipe, we're going to take little chunks out of that. So less water makes it into the storm drain, so that's less of a burden on all those pipes and on all those systems. So bioretention, this is, I'm just going to go through kind of, and you'll see the, the, the boxes that get checked off here, which is great. Bioretention, bioswales, rain gardens, this is one of the best ways that we can handle our stormwater runoff. These can be applied in parking lots, these can be applied along sidewalks, this can be applied anywhere to infiltrate the water before it makes its way to the river, before it makes its way to the storm, storm drains, via curb cuts. Instead of building a curb and channeling the water as fast as possible, as we saw in Arlington, peeling up the asphalt, <laughs> we can create curb, curb cuts and leave this water into a bioretention area where the plants and the soil and nature will take care of it and slowly put it back into the ground. Should that system be overwhelmed, then yes, there is a backup, there is an overflow. But 80% of the time plus, depending on the storm systems we have, your bioretention facility can definitely take care of that. 
<coughs> permeable pavements. The pavement picture is actually my least favorite permeable pavements, so do not think that all permeable pavements look, at, look like that. I've been installing them for 15 years, but this is definitely one, uh, one of the uglier pictures. But we have permeable pavements include porous asphalt, permeable concrete, porous pavers, there are also open grid systems like this, and then there are other asphalt alternatives um, that have been created that are great for um, light, traffic system, uh, light traffic areas, light traffic system. The idea from here is to eliminate the runoff. It's going to take that water, that say landing on a parking lot, and just put it directly into the ground where it can start to perk. It's the, it's the whole idea built in behind this. They are also, for the most part, uh, a whole lot cooler. The SRI on many of these pavements is, is a whole lot cooler than, um, than with typical asphalt. So you will, you will get that um, reduction in the heat island effect. And while they can be expensive to, be, to put in, the maintenance and the, uh, especially the winter maintenance in this area is a whole lot less. Because the water is passing through these systems, you do not have the frost heaps, because the frost heaps aren't sitting below the surface, or the water's not below the surface, pushing these up. So you do not have the, the, the frost heave damage that you would in a typical system. And you do not have the icing, because when you have that freeze thaw, which is kind of what we're in right now, and you have all that water, when that snow melts, that water is making its way through the system and working its way into the ground, so you have less icing. So there's plenty of benefits to looking into permeable pavements. Rain harvesting systems, this is something that we install on a, uh, a residential level a whole lot, but encouraging citizen rain barrels and things like that, programs like that, Rain barrels are the gateway drug to rain harvesting. They do not hold in a whole lot of water. So I have a love-hate relationship with them. I'm sure many of you have rain barrels in here. What I like about rain barrels and citizen rain harvesting programs is that it draws attention to how much runoff is actually happening. When you have like one rain event and that rain barrel is overflowing, you're like, wow. But otherwise, it just goes away. So right now, I am a big fan of harvesting for, um, for gray water use on larger scales, but I'm even a big fan of just the, the citizen program uh, just to make people aware of rain harvesting and the water that is coming from the sky. Rooftop practices, green roofs, people have a love-hate relationship with these. More often than not, even to this day, even though the practice has been uh, for a long time now, almost 20 years here in Boston, for even now people think it's a California thing, it's a European thing. For some reason, green roofs were not, not embraced with love um, here in the Northeast. Uh, it's that Yankee mentality, I think, uh, that we are slow to adopt. We have like the greatest brains in all the land here in the Northeast, but we are the last to adopt anything they suggest. <laughs> This right here, the quick, just to give you a, an idea, I worked with Youth Build Boston and we put green roofs on bus shelters around the city. And then I went out, because I'm a water nerd and if you want to find me, I'm out in the rainstorm. I went out in the rainstorm and collected water. Uh, I'm not going to show you all the data on it because you guys have seen a whole lot of data. This is all you really need. <laughs> you have the, the bus shelter rain, the bus shelter rain water that came off the gutter and you have the bus shelter with a green roof as it came off the gutter. And this was after these green roofs were only installed for about three months. So they weren't even at their fullest potential. But you can see the reduction and you can see what's coming off those bus shelters in the first flush. So this just gives you that, you know, that idea of how effective these things can be. And then constructed wetlands. This is on a, a whole, you know, this is on a grand scale, a larger scale. This can happen though. We have areas where we can build constructive wetlands. A constructed wetland is like a bioretention or a bioswale on steroids. This is a, an area that is going to handle gallons and gallons and gallons of water. This could be your way. You send this water here, let nature do her thing, and then return it to the river. And I guarantee you, in measuring <laughs> where it comes in 
and you can measure, you know, you can measure the effluent, and it is the reduction is huge. Everybody worries when it comes to all of this. Oh, maintenance. You know, what are we going to do? When I talk to uh, municipalities and cities about adopting these practices, everybody's scared. And actually, the analogy that I just came up with talking before I came here is kind of like your junior high dance or a wedding. Nobody wants to really be the first one on the dance floor. But somebody got to just get out there and just, you know, <laughs> get it going, get it moving, make it happen because we can't, we can't be wallflowers much longer. Trees. The simplest thing you can do. Unfortunately, people don't always plant trees right, but trees are the best thing you can do. Trees sequester carbon, trees slow the rainwater. Falling at 20 miles an hour, it hits that tree, it gently puts it on the ground. So it doesn't have the time to pick up speed and cause the erosion and everything that we've been facing. So trees are the simplest thing you can do. It's the simplest program that anybody can adopt because they mitigate the heat island effect as well. That's also absolutely the cheapest. So here's the need, this is what I have found. There is a huge need in the industry for people who know how to design and install green infrastructure. Landscape architects and cities are designing with green infrastructure in mind, but the people who are winning those projects and the RFPs that are written are not calling for knowledgeable professionals to stall, install these things. I know this because I have made a whole lot of money fixing the mistakes by the original contractor. Bioswales being installed upgrade from the stormwater they are supposed to collect. Somebody thought that water would run uphill. That's really not the case. If they understood what that bioswale was, because it was built to spec, they had the right soil, they had the right plants, they just didn't know what they were building, so they didn't build it correctly. So there's a huge need in this industry for trained professionals and for people to understand what green infrastructure is and how we need to move forward. So if you're an architect or a civil engineer, you need to understand what these practices are and what they're about. If you are the one writing the RFPs, this needs to be brought into the RFPs. Because I sit down with mayors, I sit down with city planners, and they're like, oh yeah, rain gardens don't work. We got four of them that failed. Those rain gardens were built on Earth Day, and nobody maintained them. Green infrastructure, like our bridges, like our roads, like our perennial gardens and our vegetable gardens, need maintenance. It's not set it and forget it. This isn't Ronco. <laughs> So, there's a whole lot of other opportunity built into this. As I mentioned, the Green Roof um, project that I did with Youth Build Boston, we've also worked with Groundwork Somerville, I've done a bunch of programs like this because there is an untapped potential of entry level and low skilled workers, people who want jobs, who want a direction, and we have this giant need of green infrastructure. So let's just say, you take those people who are dying for a direction and dying for a job and have them build a bioswale and then take care of it. Now, you have the bioswale that we desperately need and you've made your workforce. Now you have a knowledgeable workforce. They know what they built, why they built it. They've learned what plants need to be there, what plants can't be there. They've learned how to maintain it. So when the DPWs come to me and they say, we don't have the workforce, I found your workforce. They're just waiting for a job. These kids ate that up. And it's not just, I mean, it's not just kids that we, you know, that we can go at. There's plenty of people who want these jobs. All I'm saying is there is a whole group of us, I am one of them, who slow down and actually get it when you put me in nature. In a classroom, I was very fidgety. You put me out in nature, I am all good to go. I slow down, it all makes sense, <laughs> and I, I believe that this is where we should be looking. This is how we can get massive amounts of green infrastructure and our maintenance and workforce at the same time. Right here, we are, this, we got a, in this image, again, this is Youth Build Boston. 
This is one of the bioswales in Boston. And we are just all doing the fall cleanup. So in doing this, the kids went out. They had already, they'd already ex been explained. They figured they knew what the bioswale was doing. And they knew what they had to do to work with it. This right here is another two gentlemen. We spent the entire summer learning about bioswales and rain gardens and taking care of them for the Boston Parks Department. They had a log that they had to fill out. They had to check the inlets and the, out, and the outflows. They had to check for traps. They learned weeds. These guys didn't know plants and weeds and the difference between. By the end of the summer, they knew exactly what plants were supposed to be there and what plants needed to get pulled out. And then I absolutely advocate for every public green infrastructure project that goes up, there needs to be signage. We need to teach the everyday person what that was. Because if you have a bioswale or you have a rain garden and you don't have any signage, it's just a pretty garden. Nobody knows that it's an actual functioning system actively saving the world as they stand there, in this case under the bus shelter. As they stood there under the bus shelter, that bus shelter was cooling them off, cleaning their air, and cleaning their rainwater. Here's the NGICP program that I trained about, I trained. We have um, some coming up. I'm looking to get a whole lot more scheduled in this area so that we can create that workforce of trained professionals with this certification. It's, it's relatively new, but it's on par with LEED, being a LEED accredited uh, professional. With this certification, you are certified to build, maintain, inspect, and really, I guess, design, although it's not a huge design course, green infrastructure. So this is Green Infrastructure 101, but this is the launch pad for the green infrastructure workforce uh, that we are looking for. This is my information. I look forward to hearing from you, and I welcome any questions that you have. John? Oh. Okay, so this is wonderful and I'm incredibly excited about the opportunity here. So there's municipalities that are right now using green stormwater infrastructure to manage their CSOs and their long-term control plans. And some of them are almost a decade into it. And some of those plans incorporated green jobs development and there's a ton of potential for that in the Merrimack. So what do you think is necessary to take this sort of the idea that needs a systems level approach and apply it to a dispersed watershed with lots of players like the Merrimack? Buy it. We need buy it. We need people to come to the dance floor. Mm -hmm. It really is that easy because look, we have, we have a whole morning of proof. The surveys have been done, the studies have been done. Do we need more? Absolutely. Do we have to wait until every single, do we have to wait until we measure the next 10 years of, of, of runoff into the Merrimack before we start doing things? No, we need buy-in. We need everybody up and down the Merrimack to just buy in and start doing it. We need commitment, and again, we can find strategic ways to go about this. The cool thing with the bus shelters, I'll just go real quick, because you brought up youth involvement. The idea with the bus shelters was to bring green roofs low to start public conversation. The, also, the idea with the bus shelters, with Boston, it takes about 80 shelters to create one acre of land. That one acre of land offsets 27,000 gallons of water. So, but each one of those shelters we're going in with a grant, we're going in for about $5,000 that paid the kids as well. So the, the whole thing is, is not every single green infrastructure installation, not all of green infrastructure has to be in the millions of billions. We can tackle it just as green infrastructure takes little bits of water out of the system. These systems, we can install these systems a little bit at a time as budget permits, as things go. But we can't be spending time thinking about it, talking about it or whatever. All of this needs to be fast tracked. You need to buy in, you need to make it happen. But we can't be paralyzed by the giant numbers we saw this morning. 
That should call us to action. So we can't be paralyzed by those numbers, and we have to be creative in finding ways to execute these solutions as soon as possible. Uh, one more question? Hi. Great ideas. I just got one question for you. Uh, Washington's office, I don't think you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Tell you what. I'll just, just yeah, get right on out. Right 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 no. Uh, no. Based on the, well, I drive by the Funny right. River a lot. Well, hey, okay. like, respect it's... everybody else who's here, not just you. Yeah. Oh, well, hey, all right, here we go. All right? Thank you. Okay, try to take it from the top. Boston needs a lot of help, and I, I love what you're doing. And my question to you is, I drive by the Muddy River a lot, and I'm amazed at what I see, especially underneath the thoroughfare that goes by Soto Drive. Is that cleanup of the Muddy River on your on somebody's radar? Because it really needs to be looked at. Well, I mean, I don't I don't operate on that level yet. I'm waiting. I'm, no pun intended. I'm waiting for my chance on the mic. So yes, these are things that are being looked at. These are things that are being talked about. I'm sure that all of that is being discussed. I mean, from my childhood to now, nobody was you know boarding or anything on you know on the Charles you know at that time when I was a child so now I see people out there physically in the water all the time which I think is true, except 72 hours after a rain event <laughs> but people are out there all the time so progress has been made all of these things progress has been made I just think we need I feel we need to be a little more aggressive and I feel we need to start saying okay yes while reducing PFAS as a win the goal should be zero and the goal should be zero as soon as possible, not zero by 2050. Oh, I'm sorry, that's going to be a Thank you very much. Perfect. So our next speaker is Heather McMahon. She is the Executive Director of Groundwork Lawrence, a community development nonprofit working at the intersection of environment, public health, and education. Under her leadership, Groundwork Lawrence has quadrupled in size and been recognized with many local and national awards. She has spent over 25 years in the nonprofit sector building community and individual assets. In addition to leading Groundwork Lawrence, Heather is a senior fellow with the Institute for Nonprofit Practice and serves as the president of Groundwork USA. In 2010, she was honored to be selected as one of the recipients of the YWCA of Greater Lawrence's Tribute to Women Award. Please welcome Heather McMahon. I think I can say, still say good morning. Good morning. Um, the only, it's kind of weird to have your bio read and then to remember what's in it. Um, the only thing that's important about me and where I come in this is that I've lived under Merrimack my entire life. Some of you heard about our big voyage over the summer doing the whole Merrimack, and I got to kayak patch the places that I lived that I never dared to go in the Merrimack. A uh, kayak? Hmm? Hold it. Okay. Maybe we'll just put it here. Um, I now live on the Merrimack in Haverhill. I work on the Merrimack in Lawrence, and if I could really figure out a way to just commute back and forth from work on the river, I'd be ecstatic. Bye. But I know that takes all day. And the buses, not good enough yet. Transportation is part of this problem. Um, so a little about Bowerk Lawrence. Trevor, you set me up perfectly. It's about how do we get involvement and buy-in. Um, we look at the physical environment, but it's about the community, it's about changing places and changing lives, and now changing systems. Because it's really about what does the community need, want, ask for, and how do we help get them there. And it's, you know, we're doing a lot around water and, and place in the city, and Lawrence is <coughs> pavement and concrete. Um, but now, it has over 40 parks. 24 of which we've either helped build or redevelop in the last 20 years. And it's those parks with those open spaces and the trees and the gardens that are helping us make sure 
we are getting dealing with stormwater and keeping water and cleaning it versus away. Chair also mentioned Garmark Somerville, which is one of our sister organizations and the 20 of us throughout the US. We're small, we focus on things like youth and green jobs and green spaces and health. And so this is a perfect place to bring that bigger conversation together because it is about public health. And we can start talking about environmental challenges in the watershed. You know, Lawrence has three rivers. There's flooding, there's illegal dumping, there's brownfields, there's the hardscape. But challenges aren't that exciting and interesting and they scare people. So when Groundwork started, this is what people saw for the Spicket River. And that's all they really thought about. It used to change colors, right, because of the factories. And the Spicket dumps is a confluence with the Merrimack in Lawrence. Some people, though, went a little bit further and saw this and this. And it's those people that stepped forward and said, we want groundwork here, we want groundwork to help us figure out how do we make the rivers in our city, three and seven square miles, an asset, not just because of trash and contaminants, but for us um, in terms of our drinking water, our recreation, and health. And so the biggest thing I think in terms of how do you get that buy-in is you need to learn what's there, seek input, listen to the people there, right? This isn't just about coming in and deciding you want a park, it's going here and this is what it looks like. No one's gonna use it, it's not gonna be safe, and you're not gonna have any help maintaining it because our municipal budgets are being cut and we can't maintain all this infrastructure with just what we currently have for budgets and taxes. So you engage, you evaluate what, how things are going, and then you celebrate success, not at the end, but every little single one you can, that's how you make it happen. It took us over 15 years to build that Spicker River Greenway. People thought we were crazy. And it's now helping us with the Merrimack River Trail and the Rail Trail. And how do you do that? So many of you, and what's great to see is so many different nonprofits and municipalities and the government is going to the residents, asking them, what do you see? And it's not just scaring them about that brownfield, it's talking about what it can be, right? It's not just a contaminated site fenced off. It's about what could you have in there, what would it do? And taking their notes and bringing in youth. Be it architectural and making presentations, um, or green jobs, as Trevor highlighted. So we took that information after going into people's into their living rooms, into the churches, into the community centers and neighborhood, and we created a vision. And I can tell you from day one, Groundwork talked about the greenways as if, as if it already existed. And we were able to um, create that vision and then get people out there. Um, kayaking in the spigot, that, <laughs> that day turned out to be a lot more challenging than we anticipated, as you can see. Um, this makes the, the trip on the Merrimack seem pretty easy, footaging around those dams. But they did it. And we created a clean spigot campaign that was getting youth out there, that was working with the state to get funding to put signs up, to talk about what those storm drains do. And we did this with champions. And you might only have one or two to start, but they talk to folks and then you show up and then the kids get excited. And I can tell you if you go to city council and ask for something, they're a lot nicer to the youth asking for it than they are to you. <laughs> um, so the no dumping campaign, and then the Spigot River cleanup. We do that every spring, and we have between five and 700 people come out, over half of them are youth, and if it's raining, they're showing up a good 15 minutes or half hour before we even start registration, because it is about the youth, right? And it's about them feeling empowered and going home and talking to their families. But that's only once a year, right? So how do we keep doing this? So we, it's employing the youth to be out there, to learn about it, to do research, and pay them for the work they're doing. That's the other key piece is we can't expect youth to go out there and volunteer their time if they're, if they're thinking about sneakers and food and all that. Like They need to help with the family income, they need a job, and they're doing very important work. So it's really important to pay them to get out there to not just build the green roofs and the rain gardens, but to maintain them, because that's what we struggle with. 
Um, and then there's other opportunities, partnering with schools, doing the water monitoring. When you can see it and touch it, or get a trip to Mexico to show that your research that you did in the city and its impact when you're 14 years old, that's lifelong change that's going to happen. So we're getting the kids out there in any way we can. But there's also the place changes, right? This is what a two-acre property on the spigot looked like when it got brought to our attention in 2002. And, you know, the thought was this would be great for housing. Lawrence is dense. There's not enough housing. But then the residents said, but we play, our kids play here. And then we found out that it was a brownfield. And it took years. It took four years. But this is what it looks like now. And there's gardens there that are helping with, you know, the stormwater, but it also brings people to the park so it feels like a safe place. Thinking about how do we maintain it, um, who's going to come, and then doing that piece is really important. And this first park in 2006 had the first piece of the Swickerberg Greenway built into it. We kept saying it existed. We were getting there. And then we kept working. Miserville Park, we had eighth graders come to us and say they needed a skate park. And we found this place in looking at the city and where there's a possibility. And those eighth graders, um, Jared in the front, he came back when he was in college to help us cut that ribbon. There's also an important lesson about when you're working with the community is this takes time, right? So this is why the small successes, be it a park, be it a cleanup, be it just building a green roof in one of those parks, um, or a celebration to open and close the gardens, that's how you keep the conversation going. And you find out what makes people interested, and you build on that, and you help them get what they need to do it. The Cavanta site, the state, well, there was a movement that put a fifth uh, incinerator here. Community stopped that, right? We didn't need a fifth incinerator in the Merrimack Valley. Then it sat there as a brownfield, right? But that was momentum. That was what really the only thing that affects change is people was able to do. And there's the pond, there's the spigot going through there that with a few years, with some volunteer labor, because there was not enough funding to build it all professionally, and in that garden there is a green roof now, we got to here. And here. And here's again, every year the Swigger River Cleanup comes back here, so we can also remind us and celebrate. And this ties into the rail trail in Methuen, which is helping the rail trail in Lawrence, right? We're changing actual spaces, People are doing that on their own, and that's actually building momentum because all these rivers feed into the watershed, and the Merrimack River Trail is next, right? So we're, we're creating more green spaces to take in the stormwater to bring people there, but it also raises that we're bringing people to the river. How do we make sure it's safe for them? So there's a lot here about different pieces and keeping your head up and being able to vision and help others vision on what could happen. Um, when I was lucky enough, because I was not there at the beginning when people envisioned the Swick River Greenway, but I was there to help cut the ribbon. You know, people thought we were crazy for 16 years. And why it's important for all of us to come together is that people move. Um, Politicians have a two and four year horizon. They really need to show momentum and results so they don't get reelected. That's our system. Nonprofits and the people that are here longer, we can help keep this going, bring new people in, and keep that longer term vision. And we need it all together because it's government money that's probably going to build it. It may be the wages for the youth to do the stewardship needs afterwards. Um, but if we're not all here, these projects don't happen. And then we have to take care of them. We make sure the politicians are there at the cleanup, and they see the youth, how excited they are. Um, and there's other things too, it's not just parks, right? Those are a lot more expensive to build. This was a vacant lot in Lawrence. This is what it looks like now, right? Um, there are about turning liabilities into assets, and it's really because residents really pushed that. The city told us no community gardens years ago. They're messy, they're hard to maintain, and they are, because we do. Um, but that's not a problem now, because people want to grow the food, they want to be with other people in the neighborhood, get to know each other, and be outside. So if it's a big cleanup, and you join us in April and May for Earth Day, Comcast Carers Day, you come to the cleanup, 
those are big things. So then how do we move beyond one day, right? You've got a group that wants to do water quality testing. That's another way to talk to different people who, that's a little bit more. And then you start getting some data. You bring them out to walk and run. Some of you here I know have run the Spigot River Greenway walk run for, uh, 5K. I still hear to this day that people did not know about those 10 and 11 parks, brand new parks, um, and how amazing they were. Those are now advocates for how we're going to start changing our concrete and paved places into more green spaces. And it improves health and it improves, improves connectivity. But we're never done. This is the ferry site where the original Lawrence Experiment Station was. Beautiful here, beautiful here. Mm, a little scary here under the road, fenced off. But it's where the spigot joins the Merrimack. It's where the canal, canals join the Merrimack. And it now looks like this. And this is the first piece of the Merrimack River Trail that we're being able to work on. Pemberton Park has its own piece. <coughs> and that builds momentum. And that's because people said, this was supposed to be our first project back in 1999. The community said, this is a great spot. You can be at a waterfall on the river, 10 minutes from downtown and, and experience nature. It took 20 years to get here, but we did. <coughs> and once it's done, we involve the community to build a rain garden here, the swale. We've got, actually, now we need a little bit of help maintaining it. There's a lot more growing it than we need. Um, we bring the schools to the sites, right? Because it's again, how do you touch it, see it, learn about it, get excited, and what's next? Kids bring their parents in and say, I helped plant that tree. Come see it next year and next year. And we talked about the value of trees. <coughs> so again, I, was, I guess we can always talk about the challenges, but if we don't talk about the solutions, the opportunities, the way that we can figure out the way to work together, then we don't actually see those opportunities. We see a horrible alleyway. <coughs> Sorry, I'm getting over cold. Um, but that alleyway can be a garden. It can be depaved and take on some of that water. And <coughs> you can have the opportunity, just like I did, to kayak down the Merrimack in hopefully longer than four days. Um, but so this is what really helps. It's about something simple like this, <coughs> or not so simple, um, drew a lot of attention. It's about building momentum. It's about finding the opportunities, pushing your way through, opening it up more, and seeing what's next. And don't forget the youth are a key part of this, be it volunteering, jobs, education. And that's really where we need to be. Thanks. Any, maybe one or two questions from anybody? Eva, how many pro bono companies, engineering companies and agencies offer free help and advice in on any of your projects throughout the town of Lawrence, or city of Lawrence? We pay. Um, we pay for most of the work. I think it would be great to build those relationships, especially as we build some of the smaller pieces. Um, but mostly it's grant funding and we pay. So we are always open to having conversations about doing more. Well, you know the majority of companies can write that off as a tax R&D help offer. And there's companies all over the country. I just did part of a job out in the Navajo Nation. We got about $100,000 worth of engineering out of some geotechnical people. It's best to reach out to them. And they can train the youngsters in some of the techniques and knowledge. Also, you've got contractors in the local area who've got equipment. They don't use 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, earth movers and cranes and excavators. That would speed up a lot of your work. You want to come on the road with me and explain to them how that works? Yeah, why not? Great. See? It's all about coming together.
Thank you. Our final speaker today is Senator Diana DeZaglio. And let me see if I can turn this off. John, may I have some assistance? <laughs> She proudly serves as a Massachusetts State Senator for the 1st Essex District, which includes cities and towns along the Merrimack River from Methuen to Newburyport. Before winning her first race for public office as a state representative for the 14th Essex District in 2012, Diana worked for multiple nonprofit community based organizations. In this legislative session, she is a member and leader of several committees and serves as chair of the Joint Committee on Community Development and Small Business. Please welcome the Senator. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, it's still morning. We have two minutes here. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. What a great day together. Uh, great to see everybody here this morning. Absolutely fantastic. This room is packed. I had no idea that this was going to be such a packed conference, and I'm super, super energized by this today, just to see everybody here uh, inspired to get involved with the efforts that uh, everybody's been involved with with the Merrimack River. So thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedules in order to learn about what's happening with the, the Merrimack River and to participate in the conference today. My name is Diana DeZoglio. I'm the State Senator for Haverhill. I represent the 1st Essex District here in the Merrimack Valley. And I know many of you in this audience today, many of you have heard about my efforts in the state legislature. So I am going to be brief because I know that you did hear from another legislator here this morning who talked about some of the bills that are working their way through the legislative process. And they certainly don't want to be repetitive. And I know that our wonderful Congresswoman Lori Trahan is here talking about her efforts at the federal level. But just a couple of things that are particular to our local area. Number one is we recently were able to secure in the state senate and pass through the entire legislative process and get signed off by the governor uh, a combined $150,000 to come back to the Merrimack Valley to create the Merrimack River District Commission and then to facilitate a color-coded flagging program uh, that will actually be taking place in the city of Newburyport. The Merrimack River District Commission is a new group that is comprised of advocates, like all of you in this room, uh, experts from the field, local uh, elected officials, amongst others, who have decided to come together to make sure to put their, their uh, brains together to uh, make sure that we are advocating for a clean and healthy river, but also making sure that we're coming up with a set of short-term and long-term goals regarding what to do about the cleanliness of the Merrimack River moving forward. The District Commission is currently focused on combined sewer overflows in particular, but it's also focused on those sorts of other things regarding contaminants, pollution. I know we were hearing about PFAS this morning, the forever chemical that's seeping into the rivers and into our uh, drinking water that needs to be remediated. It's focusing on that, it's focusing on the other pollutants that are getting into the river. But combined sewer overflow has been the topic of the hour. It's been the topic that many of us have been discussing and been concerned about. That stormwater runoff, along with the sewage from all of our homes mixing together and overflowing into the rivers. And we have a lot of ideas about how to combat that combined sewer overflow. But the issue has been that there's been no uh, there's been no decision on exactly what steps we are going to take in a unified, man unified manner moving forward. So this district commission is meant to establish that set of goals and to say, we're united on this front and we brought all the experts and all the advocates together and we've made some decisions. The district commission recently came out with a scope of work by Brown and Caldwell, uh, based out of Andover, and they're here with us today, that outlines what the District Commission is going to be producing within the next four to six months, and the steps that it's going to take in order to make sure that we're keeping our river clean, that we're providing notifications to the public about the sewage overflows, and that there's actual action taking place, because we know there's been a lot of talk but we have yet to see action. But we need that strategic plan. So that was a huge step in the right direction. 
The uh, flagging program will be facilitated through the district commission. The color code flagging system, did you hear about this this morning from somebody who was talking about low efforts? I wasn't here, was that talked about? Okay, thank you. The flagging program uh, was actually taken from something that's happening in the Charles River watershed. They have a system where a flag goes up, a red flag, if their water is you know, not safe to go in potentially, if there's some sort of an issue and residents need to be warned that you shouldn't go swimming that day, or green if it's okay for them to go swimming in. And it allows residents to be able to decide for themselves whether or not they want to make a decision to go into the water. We are trying to implement some sort of a flagging program up here, but we need to make sure that it works. We need to make sure that we're hearing from residents about how to best implement something like this. So there's going to be a pilot in Newburyport this summer with those flags. And I'm asking all of you, because this is a pilot, it's going to take all of us to make sure that this produces something positive for our region. I'm asking all of you to pay attention to that, to participate in the program to contact the Merrimack River District Commission. Uh, Lane Glenn, President Glenn, are you here? Lane Glenn's here. Lane Glenn is uh, currently directing the efforts of the Merrimack River District Commission, and he is going to be helping to facilitate this flagging program and make sure that we are doing everything appropriately and that it's actually working. Alongside of those color-coded flags that you're going to be seeing growing up in the city of Newburyport, uh, we're also going to be working on a website a website that families can visit before they go down to the public docks and to the public beaches to be able to see whether or not it's a good day to go swimming and to bring their family down there. Because we all know that notification is great and that we need testing of the water, but it really doesn't mean much to hear that there's been a sewage spill into the river if you and your family have already gone swimming. Right? So that's a really big public safety issue, and we really can't wait on the legislature to pass these notification bills before we take action. Because unfortunately, this bill has gotten stuck in the House of Representatives for the last, last several years. And you know we've heard for a long time that it's, it's complicated and it takes a lot of funding, so on and so forth. I'm going to tell you something that you probably don't know, but government can be a little bit slow sometimes. <laughs> and that was shocking. Um, but being elected, listen, being a native of the Merrimack Valley, being born and raised here, I share your frustrations, okay? Born and raised in the I share your frustrations. It can take too long sometimes. And even though we all keep advocating the best that we can, you know, sometimes these bills they don't make it through the process in time to actually impact our region the way that they need to, so we need to get creative. And that's what we've done by making sure that we got this funding passed through the state budget, that while these bills are stalled in the committee process and being held up and being sent to study for the hundredth time, that we can at least get some funding back to the Merrimack Valley to take some action here together and make sure that we're doing our part together. So that funding is state funding that's going to pay for that pilot program to take place. That state funding is going to pay to make sure that this district commission can continue to meet regularly and can continue to come up with those short-term and long-term goals. Uh, it's going to fund that website so that everybody will have an opportunity, hopefully, to be able to go onto the website, find out what's going on with the water, again, based on historical data. If there's heavy rainfall, if there's a power outage, shows are generally times when you would see a red flag. You know, when there's this many inches of rainfall, there's usually a CSO. Red flag might not be the best day to go swimming. Or if there's a power outage, and one of the water treatment plants goes down, that might be a red flag day, based on historical data. And we're going to still advocate for the notifications and the water testing, but it's good to have both of those things going on, right? the pre-notification, and then the notification afterwards, so that we can see how those two things line up. We're also going to, we're also going to uh, be working through the District Commission on that pilot program uh, on the development of an app for your phone 
So you can have an app on your phone, hopefully, moving forward. And again, this is going to be subject to appropriation. Hopefully, the funding is going to allow for that app to be developed. But we're going to be fighting for funding for this, for the development for an app for your phone so that you can actually just have something, click on it, let it come up right away, and have some real-time real -time answers. And we think that those things would be helpful. But I do um, just want to say that all of the things that we've done so far in the legislative delegation, like I said, I know one of my colleagues was talking earlier, and Congressman Richard Hand was here talking earlier. All of the things that we do in the state legislature are, are based on the feedback that we get from all of you in this room. You're the advocates, you're the residents, you're the elected officials. We need to hear from you in order to be able to advocate on Beacon Hill. So if you see something, say something, okay? And if you, you have some concerns about legislation that's pending or about the, the votes that are coming up uh, in the committee process on, on some of these pending bills or on things that you don't see happening that you think should be happening, please, we're just a phone call away. Okay, we're all local and we're here at your service. We're Jackson Jeans of all trades. We do, we do our best to make sure that we're up to speed on all of these issues, but it really does take all of us pulling together and advocating uh, alongside of all of you. So I just want to say a big thank you to all of you for continuing to come out today to advocate, to share your expertise with all of us, and to make sure that you keep educating both your elected officials and the community on the importance of keeping the Merrimack, Merrimack River healthy, safe, and clean, and beautiful for all of us. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Just a real quick one. You mentioned sure. the Brown and Caldwell statement of work. Is that publicly available? Yes, it is publicly available, actually. Uh, uh, President Glenn, did you want to talk about the Brown and Caldwell? Uh, well, we had a press release about a couple weeks ago. Uh, the district commission, there we go. Sorry, there we go. If the Watershed Council, Christine, or somebody, uh, you've got contact list for people over here, yes? Yeah, you sent us the Yeah, we'll get the. We'll make sure that the Watershed Council has that information so they can send that out to everybody who's here. Our uh, district commission's meeting next week. Kirk Westfall is here from Brown and Caldwell listening in today uh, to be sure we're getting as much information as possible going forward. We'll make sure everybody gets that who's here today. Thank you. And if you do have any questions about how to get involved with the Merrimack River District Commission, like I said, President Glenn is heading that up through the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission. Um, so feel free to either contact him or to contact my office. We will be happy to, uh, you know, explain to you how to get involved and let you know about when the next meetings are and way that you can, you can be involved. Okay. Any other questions? I know I'm standing between you and lunch. Yes, somebody back there. So am I correct in understanding the Merrimack River District Commission, right, is a Massachusetts-based organization and only Massachusetts? Yes, that would be correct. So the Merrimack River District Commission was something that a few of us here in this room got together and decided to create. And it was due to the fact that many of the bills that many, many of us have been advocating for have not made their way through the legislative process and we've been waiting for too long for action to be taken regarding the, Mer the issues surrounding the Merrimack River. Uh, so this was something that was created locally. I you know, see uh, Dan Gravix here, Heather McMahon was part of this, many others uh, in the Watershed Council, many other advocates uh, came together. Mayor Holiday, uh, Karen Connor, we came together and decided to create this district commission, but then it needed funding. So I fought for and was able to secure with the help and support of my colleagues. So thank you, legislators, wherever you live, for voting for this, it was unanimous. Um, some funding to be able to create this at the local level and allow them to be able to have meetings and do research and make sure that they're able to uh, contract out with or uh, groups like Brown and Caldwell and make sure that we can get those strategic plans in place to be able to do the flagging program, for example. But yes, this is just the state of Massachusetts. Uh, so, you know, as state legislators, unfortunately, you know, we can't uh, require that New Hampshire adopt certain sets of standards, so that's been one of the challenges. But they have been willing to come to the table 
and to be a part of the district commission. And it's my understanding that after we meet in Newburyport in a couple of weeks, that the next time that we meet, that we're planning on meeting in New Hampshire, to meet with some of their elected officials there, who are very interested in being helpful regarding our efforts. Uh, they're not required to, but they have been willing to come to the table. So we're very grateful for that, and uh, look forward to that meeting, and we'll, we'll keep you all in the loop. If you want to contact us, we can let you know what's happening with that. I can tag team on to yes. the Senator's comments there. I'll simply add, um, indeed, uh, part of the work of the District Commission over the last couple months has been to ensure that those partnerships upriver and interstate uh, are strong. So we have involvement from the National Planning Commission, Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission, Nui Pick, uh, regional and New Hampshire agencies, and trying to ensure that although the commission itself is formed, as the Senator mentioned, within Massachusetts, uh, it is interacting with and engaging in as many ways as are appropriate and possible with all these other agencies. Any other questions? All right, it looks like y'all want to get to lunch. So I will, if, there's, if there are any other questions, I'm here, okay? Come and find me. But other than that, can I let them go to lunch or do you want to do that? Never mind, she's got you for one more second. Sorry about that. Alrighty, so you can grab your lunch in the atrium and join us back here for networking and lunch with an expert. And just to let you know, in addition to our speakers, Gabby Queen, Policy Director at Bass Rivers Alliance, Jeff Daly, Environmental Scientist, and Jean Porter, Chair of the Lower Merrimack River Local Advisory Committee, will be available at a, as our lunch experts um, to dive deeper into a lot of these issues. And you'll see our, our uh, table tents, little cards set up on the tables out there. Uh, if you want to sit and talk to an expert and, and talk a little bit more, great. Um, bring your lunch here, network, uh, enjoy, and uh, we'll do a little wrap-up after lunch. But thank you very much for your attention.